So welcome to everyone joining us today. We're excited to have you. And I'm excited to talk with author Eddie Huffman about John Prine in spite of himself. If you have questions, please post them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. So I'm gonna start by introducing Eddie. Eddie is a ninth or 10th generation North Carolinian who has been writing about music legends, muscle cars, obscenity trials, moonshiners, civil war reenactors, and murderous ventriloquist dummies since before Lady Gaga was born. John Prine, in spite of himself, is the first book he has written on his own. He has also contributed to Rolling Stone, the New York Times, and many other publications. He's an avid rail trail writer, disc golfer, semi-professional photographer and videographer, and an occasional movie extra. So welcome, I'm so happy to have you here. Uh, do you want to get started by maybe talking a little bit about the book and if you want to read a passage? Sure thing. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome, everybody. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, let's see. Well, the, the book um, came out in the first edition came out in 2015, and there's a, a new new version that came out, a new edition that came out last year. Um, covers John Prine's life and times, um, went back to his family's origins in rural Kentucky. Um, his early years in the Chicago suburbs, his early songwriting efforts when he was a mail carrier. He worked several years carrying the mail before he turned turned pro as a songwriter and singer. Um, the way he stumbled into a record deal with a major label, his career ups and downs, uh, which included pioneering his own independent record label kind of before any, almost anybody else was doing that. Um, his personal ups and downs, including three marriages, having children in his 40s and surviving two bouts with cancer his collaborations with other artists, his dabbling in movies, and his influence on countless contemporary country, folk, and Americana artists. And I will read a short passage. This is um, about when, when he kind of first got his start. He was still carrying mail, and he... Um, hold on one second. Okay, there we go. This was he. He was taking. He'd taken guitar lessons for years at the Old Town School of Music in Chicago. Um, was going to open mic nights, but you know, was not at all thinking about becoming a professional musician. So this is kind of when when he kind of gets over that hump or starts to get over that hump. After a guitar lesson at the Old Town School, Prine would check out the talent playing the weekly open mic night at a neighborhood bar. For a while, the Old Town crowd would hit the Saddle Club near the Earl of Old Town. But Prine lacked the gumption to test his own songs before a real live audience. I was very nervous about singing the songs in public for the first time, he said, because I thought that they would come across as too detailed, too amateurish, because I hadn't heard anybody being that detailed. And I thought there must be a reason for that. I must not be doing it the right way, whatever the right way is. But I knew the songs were very effective to me, and they reached me. And I was very satisfied with the songs, but I didn't know how they would relate to other people because I didn't consider myself a normal person. He loved to sing, however, even if, he, even if he wasn't crazy about the sound of his own voice. One Sunday night in 1970, after a couple of beers at the fifth peg, Prine started talking shit under his breath about the open mic talent. People sitting with him challenged him to put his money where his mouth was. He struggled through Old Folks, which he later renamed Hello in There, Paradise, and Sam Stone. I was writing these songs totally for myself, not thinking that anybody was going to hear them, he said. He got the songs out only to be greeted by silent stares. If it had been a Bugs Bunny cartoon, there would have been crickets chirping. I started shuffling my feet and looking around, he said, and then they started applauding and it was a really great feeling. It was like I found out all of a sudden that I could communicate, that I could communicate really deep feelings and emotions. And to find that out all at once was amazing. The owner of the fifth peg came over and asked him if he wanted a job. Doing what, Prine said. I wasn't trying for a gig, he said. I didn't know what a gig was. The owner offered to pay Prine to sing, and I said, man, I can't sing. And he said, just come in here and sing three 40-minute sets on a Thursday night. And he says, and you can keep half the door. So I did, and I started doing that, and I was delivering mail during the day. He was 23 years old. I love that. When, uh, I, I think that's one of the things I really found interesting about him is that is he really kind of, through his whole career, was like, I'm not exactly sure how how I how I got to this point, and I'm super excited that people yeah. like me. Like I, yeah. I I I I really like I just really love that that it you know um, 
uh, that he always kind of, it seems like he always kind of had a, like, I, I'm not sure how I, how I got here, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Sort of like a lifelong case of imposter syndrome. Yes, like, yes, yeah. definitely, definitely. So um, his career obviously had great longevity. He started really kind of in the 70s and was full of highs and lows. What about him drew you to want to write about his work in life? Um, it was a combination of, I, I'd been a big fan for probably 20 years or so, and it also happened to fit this, the book series, <laughs> which which worked out well. Um, this is for University of Texas Press, and a, a longtime colleague of mine, David Minconi, um, was one of the editors, and Peter Blackstock, who recently left the Austin American Statesman, was the other editor for the series, and they suggested I pitch a book. They knew my work, and the books at that point, the series has kind of branched out some since then, but in those days, there were book, they had done books on um, Ryan Adams, Merle Haggard, Dwight Yoakam, and I just thought Prime would be a good fit. And also just, you know, he's an interesting character, um, wonderful songwriter. I'd seen him in concert several times going back to the 1980s, owned a lot of his records. Um, a very, very soft-spoken, low-key kind of guy, but you could tell there was a lot going on under the surface, which which made him interesting to write about. Um, he also felt a little bit like a kindred spirit. Um, he came from this, even though he grew up in the Chicago suburbs, he came from a Southern working class family, as I did. Uh, similar sense of humor. Uh, he had a bunch of brothers, as I do. Uh, loved a good story, whether via songs, movies, or books. Um, and also just somebody, I'd, I wasn't interested in writing sort of a tabloid scandal sort of book. I wanted wanted something positive and, and you know, enjoyable. And he, he kind of fit that. He had an interesting life, but not one filled with, you know, criminal activity and scandals and that sort of thing. Um, and just, you know, somebody I would enjoy spending a couple of years with vicariously. Um, just some, somebody that would be, I would really enjoy listening to his music over extended periods and learning a lot about him and just, you know, so, so, something I could really sink my teeth into and, and not get sick of him after two or three years. Well, I have to say, we we actually love the the press's music series. I, I will say that we we I frequently mind that for author visits. So nice. um one of the things we we actually have a big kind of music program as 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 part of the library programming that we do. We have our own streaming platform for uh local musicians and and some other things like that. And so uh Excellent. music uh author visits are are kind of something I always try to kind of fit into kind of our overall thing. So if you have not been to the presses webpage and seen the other great music series books that they have, absolutely I say check it out because there is some really, there are some really great ones and uh some that, you know, that I've been salivating about having other people come. So <laughs> well, good, good. Uh, we appreciate so, the support. Um so one of the things I, I thought was really interesting in your book, and and it's not the first time I've heard it about other artists, but, but I think it, it's something to kind of talk about, is that early in his career, he, like many others, was discussed as the next Dylan. And I think it's really interesting that that I think the music press and and kind of critics or whatever are always looking for the next one of him. Um, mm -hmm. And um, for at least 50 years or so. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, they all, all of the people who have been discussed as the next Dylan are outstanding musicians in their own right. Um, why do you think this is a common talking point? Um, I've probably you know, used that sort of shorthand myself over the years. It's just it's an easy way to you know, sort of say a lot, or I guess ideally you're trying to say a lot about somebody in, in just a few words. Um, let's see. And it's, yeah, it's an easy handle. It's just a quick and dirty way to put somebody in, in a box, basically. Um, and I was thinking it's, it's um, when, when Prine's first album came out in 71, Dylan was pretty new. He was like maybe seven or eight years as a public figure at that point. And he had just you know, dramatically changed what a sort of popular singer could be you know there, there were if, if you listen to a lot of sort of you know folk music old mountain singers old blues singers you might hear some stuff kind of in the dylan vein but you know the american public had not heard anything like bob dylan and you know the, the sort of the, the the public at large and so um 
you know, singing these really personal, wordy, unconventional songs. Um, just, yeah, really opened up a lot of doors for what you could do with popular music. And I think just anybody that sort of followed in that vein with sort of an unconventional voice, um, wordy songs, just, just a very, you know, eccentric, um, unique individual approach to singing and songwriting. It, it was easy to, to put that Dylan label on them. And, you know, it happened, happened to Prine, happened to Loudon Wainwright, who wrote a great song called um, Talking New Bob Dylan about all those people you know, that happened to Springsteen. Just there, were, there was a long line of people up to, the, like you said, the present day that, that got that label. Um, but it's also, it's a high compliment. You know, Dylan is, is one of the most respected musicians in American history. So, you know, it's not like calling him the new Pat Boone or the new Justin Bieber. It's <laughs> it's a high high praise to be called the next Dylan or the new Dylan. Yes, I, I definitely agree with that. I also think it's interesting that they really in some ways were contemporaries, right? They And even many of the people oh, yeah. that they were like comparing at the same time, right? They were comparing Springsteen as he was coming up at the same time. And they were mm -hmm. all kind of contemporaries and they all kind of, uh, they played together, they they did things together. I think I remember that, that Dylan has recorded some Prine songs or is that, the opposite he has direction. definitely played some live. I don't know if yes. he ever actually recorded, or, or I don't think any have been released. I think he told Prime one time that he'd recorded a couple, but they have not surfaced if he did. So. Yeah. But yeah, there, there's a story in the book about he and John Prine and his buddy Steve Goodman hung out with, with Dylan. I think I think it was maybe Chris Christopherson and Carly Simon and Dylan showed up. I, it's been a while since I've <laughs> uh, thought about that story but um it, you know that they, they knew each other and, and those people like that would cross paths at festivals and just you know a lot a lot of those musicians knew each other in that era and can you talk a little bit since you've mentioned christopherson um mm -hmm. the the kind of goodman and prine get discovered and christopherson has kind of plays a, a kind of a large sort sort of role in that and kind of how that oh, sure. yeah sure. yeah yeah, um, well, Goodman was opening. Um, Goodman's another another great Chicago singer songwriter. Um, he and Prime were good buddies from late '60s on, and he was opening for Christopherson at a club in Chicago, and kept bugging him, saying, "You got to come here, hear my friend John play." And Christopherson kept blowing him off and blowing him off, and finally went over to see him. And Paul Anka, the the pop singer, who was you know very different sort of singer, but he was, I think. Was trying to get into management at that point and had some connections with Christopherson. I'm, I'm once again, I forget all the, the fine details, but it ended up being Christopherson and Anka both coming with Goodman to hear Prine play. And I think Prine was asleep in a booth at a restaurant. <laughs> they woke him up to play his songs just for this little crowd, you know, little group of people. And um, he did basically everything he had written up to that point, which is you know, maybe five or six songs, I don't know. And Christopherson asked him to play them all again. And then I think it was Anka um, agreed to pay for Prine and Goodman to fly to New York. And they both got record deals. It's just like the easiest, you know, easiest falling into the music business ever. And, you know, Prine, like I said, he's still a mailman. He's not thinking about this as a career. And suddenly he signed to Atlantic Records with Led Zeppelin and Aretha Franklin. So, um, you know, it, it was pretty, pretty dramatic change. You know, he's still, he's stuck with delivering mail for a little bit, but, you know, that, that changed fairly quickly, obviously. But, um, yeah, he, yeah, a lot of people try for desperately for years to get that, to have that sort of break in the music business. And for Prime, it's like, you know, falling out of the boat into the lake. It was just the easiest thing in the world. Well, and I think, it, I think it's funny because, right, it's kind of like everyone talks about the Hollywood, you know, dime, dime, being, being, being discovered in the, in the dime, dime store soda fountain or whatever, but yeah, in some sure. ways, yeah. and, and, that that really rarely didn't actually happen, but in some ways he kind of actually has that, that origin story. And I love that yep. there's so many uh, names that, you know, people recognize and know that are kind of all, they're all kind of involved in mm -hmm. kind of bring, bringing each other up in a lot, in a lot of ways too, right there. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it, this is, this seems like it's such an era of, they're kind of they're hanging out at festivals. They're they're getting they're hanging out with each other. They're playing with each other. They're collaborating and then creating amazing music out of kind of the collaborations that they that they're they're experiencing. Absolutely. With that. 
Yeah, no, that makes me think of Bonnie Raitt. Um, you know, Prine, Prine wrote Angel from Montgomery, which became one of her early signature songs. And, you know, that that really helped kind of put her on the map. And then when she got really big, like I actually saw him open for, for Bonnie Raitt at a big 20,000 seat amphitheater one time. So, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. He helped her out early on. She helped him out later on. It, it was, a, you know, I think there was a lot of that sort of thing that, that went on in that era. Yeah, and it's, I, I think, too, it it seems like, um, right, that that's still kind of the, all of the scene is still fledgling. And even though mm -hmm. there are record labels and those things, it's still not as kind of corporate solidified as it is yeah, yeah. today, right? It makes it much harder for those sorts of things to happen oh, now absolutely. than 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 it did then. And people got like artists got a lot more a lot more time to develop and grow an audience back then. You could you could make five or six albums that didn't sell especially well. And you know, just more, sort of build your way to an audience. And now it's sort of like if you don't, if it doesn't happen, first album, just you're gone, you're done. Yeah. They're moving on to somebody else. Yeah, which is which is sad because I think we're missing we're missing out maybe on some some kind of diamonds in the rough who haven't who haven't honed their they haven't honed themselves yet, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've kind of talked about Bonnie Raitt and some other ones. He worked with an amazing lineup of artists from all mm -hmm. over the music spectrum. Um, I actually spent some time today listening to his duets album with oh, yeah. uh, so many amazing female singers. Um, mm -hmm. can, can you talk about what he took from others for inspiration and kind of how he influenced others in return? Oh, sure. Um, well, his his family was really his first big influence. Um, his dad was a huge country music fan, listening to country radio all the time. His parents would take him to see people like Johnny Cash in concert. His brother took him to see Doc Watson early on, um, and his brother was a, was a folk um, viol uh, fiddle player and had a, a duo. Um, I think at some point, I'm not sure exactly when the duo was around, but he he really influenced John to to start playing music. Um, so there, you know, there was that family influence early on, um, and just the, the the part of Kentucky they were from is pretty amazing. Um, I'm not sure how all, how much all of this influenced Prine, but um, Muhlenberg County in Western Kentucky, it's where the Everly Brothers were from. It's where Merle Travis is from. Bill Monroe is from literally the next county over, just across the river. That, that Prine sings about the Green River in Paradise. Bill Monroe is from just across the Green River. Um, so it's an extremely rich musical world out there. Um, so it, I'm sure that that had rubbed off on him some. Um, he was a big Roger Miller fan, loved the humor and storytelling of Roger Miller. Um, Dylan was, was a clear influence. Um, just as a sort of alluding back to what I was saying earlier, freed, freed Prine and, and lots of others to write songs that were kind of rootsy and surreal at the same time, singing in a more natural, folky kind of way that you didn't you know, didn't really hear in popular music before that. Um, Steve Goodman, who we talked about, was a, a big influence. Uh, they, I guess they were a big influence on each other. And um, Goodman really, Goodman was much more driven partly because he had leukemia and he knew it didn't have... Um, was not going to have a long life. And so he was, he, he felt much more of a sense of urgency, I think, for things to happen and pushed Prime in ways that Prime was not pushing himself. <laughs> and they, they wrote some songs together. The most notable one was You Never Even Called Me By My Name, uh, which David Allen Coe had a big hit with, uh, was sort of a parody of country songs that Prime didn't put his name on because he was afraid, like it would make his father mad. He's afraid people would be upset at him making fun of country music. Um, and then Goodman ended up producing one of his albums. But um, Johnny Cash said that Prine was one of his four favorite songwriters. Um, by the 90s, people like Bruce Springsteen and Tom Petty were, were contributing to Prine's records. You mentioned those duet albums, which are just wonderful. People like Lucinda Williams and Iris DeMint and you know, tons of other women that he did the, the duets with. Um, and up, up to his, his last album, um, you have people like Brandy Carlisle, Jason Isbell, Margaret Price. Um, just the, there's, it, it's, I don't think I could count how many modern country and Americana and folk artists um, count Prine as a, as a huge influence. He's, he's just, you know, every, everybody seems to cite him as an influence in the last, last decade or so. And what I enjoy about his music is it's obviously him. 
right? I, the, even in the, I, I, well, I think one of the things I really like about Americana music to start with is they're all such kind of unique sounds, you know, for the most part, you can almost immediately identify what band that is, what mm -hmm. singer that is. And, and I would say with many other music genres, like you, you're not always sure. You're not yeah. always sure who who is that. You're but, not you're not getting a lot of auto tune in, in America. So. Right, right. <laughs> but he definitely has a very distinctive voice in his writing style, but also in his singing style. Right, like you you immediately know. Oh, the right, you know this is him, and you know, um, and you 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 alluded to that he he thought that the way he wrote songs was was not right because they were super detailed but kind of talk mm -hmm. about his, his writing um because i find it very fascinating yeah um it, it's it, as you said there, there's no mistaking his the, the the timbre of his voice or his songwriting voice just yeah nobody else wrote songs like john prine um and it, I actually kind of came up with a list of um, uh, maybe jumping ahead of the game here a little bit, but um, just he, he kind of wrote in so many different um, styles and sort of different themes. Um, the list I came up with, this is, you know, there's, there's probably more than I came up with. But this is just kind of a, a shorthand. Great character songs. I mentioned Angel from Montgomery earlier. Grandpa was a carpenter, which was about his his real grandfather. Donald and Lydia, which was inspired by his time in basic training in the army. Unwed Fathers, which is just a, a gorgeous song about a, a young unwed mother. Um, let's see, heartbreak songs about lost love, aging, and death. Um, that, that includes everything from Hello in There, Mexican Home about the death of his father, Sam Stone, his legendary song about a, a Vietnam veteran who basically you know, kills himself with, with drugs after the war. Um, Bruised Orange, which is a true story based on a, an incident where a, a kid was killed by a train in his hometown, a commuter train. Um, Everything is Cool, When I Get to Heaven, which is off his last album, kind of you know, where he's he's looking forward to, to be, being reunited with his uh, brother who's died and his his aunts and just all, all his beloved relatives. Um, there's also a lot of these kind of surreal story songs like Sabu visits the Twin Cities alone, Lake Marie, Jesus, the Missing Years, uh, which is one of my favorites. Uh, lots of sort of tall tales, funny story songs like Bottomless Lake, Christmas in Prison, Dear Abby, Illegal Smile, um, and like joyous songs about love and sex. Songs like Be My Friend Tonight, Unlonely, and In Spite of Ourselves, which is the the title track of one of that first duets album and, and which inspired the, the title of my book. Um, and so he always brought a, I think a really strong sense of, of melody in his songwriting. Um, but no one would call his vocals pretty, I don't think, but they were just sort of very warm and friendly. Just, to, I think one critic said you could always kind of hear the smile in his voice when he sang. Um, he was an excellent finger picking guitar player. Um, and his records were, were pretty diverse. You'd, some of them would be almost exclusively just him and his guitar. Um, sometimes it'd be him with like, you know, fiddles and, and mandolins, sort of folky country sort of instrumentation. And he did a lot of albums with full rock bands and toured with, with variations on all those things. So um, good mix of, you know, songwriting themes, good mix of musical styles. Um, and just, it, he, he wrote songs with uh, remarkable economy. Um, just, could, could say a huge amount in, in a line or two. Um, great empathy, just wonderful character sketches, uh, wonderful sense of humor, as I've said several times. And I, I don't know that anybody in songwriting history has come up with a more memorable cast of characters than the people in John Prine's songs. Yeah, I mean, I just love that it's so varied. I love that you can listen to him and it's just such a great mix of different tones and and themes and 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 arrangements that that you're going to get. I, I I always find that's really um, that's really fascinating. Um, and you you'd mentioned this that he at a time when it wasn't normal had his own uh, record label. Um, 
I think mostly he started that because he got he got dropped finally from his yeah, major yeah. label for not selling enough albums. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but certainly with his own record label was selling enough to keep that record label in print and and mm -hmm. then support other artists. Can you can you kind mm -hmm. of talk about that? Because Goodman also his friend Goodman also had his own label as well, correct? Which is yeah. very unusual for that, that, that time. Oh, yeah. 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 This was the beginning of the eighties, kind of like right before MTV hit and just, there was a lot of changes for the record business. Things went from, things were much more sort of, um, I mean, it, yeah, there was a, a ton of money in the record business in the seventies, but it was still a little more sort of mom and pop. And by the eighties, it was just a big corporate, you know, thriller and Michael Jackson and Springsteen selling. 20 million records. It was just a very different ball game in the 80s than a lot of what was happening in the 70s. So, and Prine kind of saw the writing on the wall. He'd been through three major labels by 1980 and was not selling as great on any of them. And Goodman started, I think it's called Red Pajamas Records around 1980 or 81. And Prine thought, well, let's, let's do the same thing. And it was absolute shoestring, you know, operation. Um, his manager got a second mortgage on his house to help pay for it. Um, they basically got people, it's like an early version of Kickstarter. They got, um, people would, would like pre-order a record months before, you know, like before he'd even gone in the studio to make the record. And they would use those pre, the, the money from those pre-orders to pay for making the record. And that, that worked really well. He, he, you know, that, that label has been going strong for 40 some years now. Um, so yeah, he, and he brought along people like, um, some old friends of his, like, I think Keith Sykes was on there for a while, but Todd Snyder, who's a prominent American artist was, was on old boy records for a while. And, um, who's the leaning man, I forget the leaning man's name, but there's a lot of, a lot of his buddies, he, he would kind of give record to deal soon, give a leg up. Um, and just, yeah, he, I think had a lot of fun with it and, um, ended up having a really big success with um, his album, The Missing Years, and I believe it was 1991. Ended up selling, I think, about a quarter of a million copies, which is fairly small. You know, it's not thriller level, but for a you know, ind little independent label, it's a massive success. So, uh, you know, they did, did really well with that independent label. And it's amazing to think they were doing pre-sales via mail, right? Like, this is not... There's no, right. internet, no, no internet, right? At that point. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and making enough money to be able to do the recording and, mm -hmm. and press those records and then yeah. mail mail them out to people, right? Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. this is very much a, uh, I, so no, I think, no big label to make it happen. Yes. Yeah. 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 Really, really fascinating and, and kind of piggying back off his, his original job to figure out how to, kind of keep him himself, yep, yep. you know, going and, and alive. Right. I mean, uh, have faith in the U S mail. So. <laughs> he did. So before we go to uh, comments, questions in the chat, cause we've got quite a few going on there. Okay, um, sure. Let's kind of, uh, I'm going to change tax for just a second. Yeah. Um, talk about your writing process, how you, how you do your research, how you kind of, gather all your stuff and then mm -hmm. kind of what is your process for how you actually do your writing okay um part part of with with a book like this is just listening to a lot of records just just sort of you know revisiting the stuff i knew visiting you know learning about the stuff i didn't know and just you know sort of immersing myself in his music but yeah just just you know going going to libraries going online digging up old articles just finding whatever i could um, and as I mentioned to you before we started the program, I, I live with a, a librarian, as you can see by the old card catalog behind me. She's an archivist. She's really good at research. So she's great. Like she helped me a lot with um, Gwen, Gwen Erickson is her name, by the way. Uh, she helped with um, a, like genealogy for Prine's family. And she actually, we, we went to, I went to Chicago by myself to go to Prine's hometown, visited his son. Um, the house where he grew up, walked through his old high school, just kind of you know, visited some of the landmarks of his life. Um, but then I met up with Gwen in Nashville and we drove up to Muhlenberg County where his family was from. And we were driving by the little local library in um, Greenville, Kentucky. And it's just a little kind of like, you know, strip, little downtown strip and old fashioned downtown. And she's like, we should, we should go in there and see what they've got. And I'm just like, it's a little small town library. They're not going to have anything. And we go in and they've got this huge file of John Prine stuff. 
that's just and like and a lot of it's stuff that's you know, one thing I think a lot of people now think that everything's online. We don't really need to physically look at things. It's like, oh no, there were all kinds of articles in that file at the library that I have never seen anywhere else. They just because of the you know the local librarians had saved that material, it was available and it's in the book now, and it would not be there if not for them. So grateful for librarians, grateful for, for that. Um, but yeah, did did you know, like to, I, I'd hope to to work with Brian on the book. I had interviewed him in the past, but um, uh, uh, unfortunately, he did not cooperate. Um, I uh, talked to a guy that was good friends with with Brian and said that. Uh, well, I talked to several people I, more after the fact than before the fact, but said his ma his manager who died around the time the book came out said he was basically too much of a watchdog, was overprotective. And this guy was good friends with with Prine and really liked my book. And he thought, you know, it would have would have been great if we'd been able to work together, but that didn't work out. So I had to just rely on a lot of a lot of other kinds of material to make this happen. Uh, went to there's a great uh, library at the, uh, Middle Tennessee State University has a um, thing's called the Center for Popular Culture or something like that. They've got a great library with tons of music related stuff. Um, the Southern Historical Collection at the University of North Carolina, which is my alma mater in Chapel Hill. They've got an amazing collection of music materials. So just a lot of that kind of stuff, a lot of online materials, uh, YouTube videos, just there's so much out there now. And one thing I learned from, from this book and from my next book is just like, I would just get a little, little germ of an idea or just see a little odd reference and like, okay, let's, let's, let's type that in and see if anything pops up. And that's how I came up with there's, there's a really fun Elvis story in there where um, one of, one of the, guys in elvis's band saying like elvis put him on the spot it's like your turn do a song in a concert and he sang a Brian song and elvis loved the song and had him sing it to him backstage afterward over and over and um that was just kind of a random i can't remember exactly how i came to that but it's like i learned to like not censor my those little ideas like that and just yeah so a lot of times they lead nowhere but sometimes they lead to something really interesting so yeah just just kind of let my you know try not to go down too many time-consuming rabbit holes but you know just just let my imagination go and and um just keep keep an ear out for interesting stories that, that might add something that I'm, it might not be obvious up front and otherwise i just you know just just park in my little office and my cat sits on my lap most of the time my, uh, gwen says that sandy the cat deserves co-author credit on my next book because he's like <laughs> halfway on the keyboard most of the time um but yeah just it's it's Write, writing is a whole lot of, you know, putting your butt in a chair and, and getting it done. All right. So let's let's go to some audience questions. Uh, so you kind of just answered the first one. The first one was somebody had asked about had had you met John Prine and did he have input in, into the into the book? Um, but mostly research is kind of, of what you used for this. Yes. Yeah. 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 And yeah, it was it was frustrating. I would I would love to have had you know full access. It would have been a you know would have been a different experience, but made the most. And it was it was a big break for me. So I, you know, I was determined to make it happen one way or the other. And <laughs> I feel like I got a good book out of it. Would would love to have you know would have been a different book with his cooperation. But you know I did did what I could under the circumstances. I still I I I love the kind of the tidbit of finding the the little snippet of information and then seeing where the the threads of that go right because mm -hmm. it's surprising what you can you can find out um yeah. so how many overseas concerts did he do i know he played in europe some but yeah i don't i don't really have a good answer for that there are there are websites out there that have kind of a crazy amount of information about who played where and when so there may be that information out there but um, yeah, he, he did play you know, in the UK and, and across Europe some, and uh, I'm not recalling him ever touring like Japan or Australia, places like that, but I'm um, pretty sure he did did some European tours at least, and that's that's about as much as I can tell you about that. And And kind of what I sort of remember from the book is that he did a lot of touring kind of in the beginning, but as as he was getting, you know, 30, 40 years in, he wasn't doing as much touring, right? So some of those opportunities may not have been as open then depending maybe, maybe on when not, he is. Yeah. yeah. 
But he, I mean, he, he toured fairly regularly through most of his career. And I'm sure he did more as a, you know, single 20, 20 something year old versus, you know, a dad in his fifties and sixties, yes, but yes. He did, a, did a, did a fair amount. And, um, and I should mention, he, he met his, his third wife, his third and final wife, um, and mother of his children in Ireland. In Dublin, so um, definitely did did a lot of stuff in the UK, and that and ended up they ended up buying a house over there and spending a lot of time with her family, and so you know that that was a big part of that that time in Ireland and that Ireland connection was a big part of of his life. Um, do we know roughly how uh, how many albums he has out there? It's it's a it's a lot, isn't it? It seems like it's a um, lot. I would guess twenty plus counting live albums and greatest hits and that sort of thing and you know they're, they're, like there was one called the singing mailman delivers which was some of his early demo recordings from before he had a record deal so yeah i would guess 20 to 25 approximately and i will say we do have not a lot because our cd collection is 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 kind of starting to to dwindle some but we do have yeah. several of his uh uh, his albums on uh, CD. We do actually have that singing mailman one because I mm -hmm. checked it out to listen to. Uh, yeah. But also, I will say that I found his official YouTube page today, and there's a lot of really great um, music and videos and uh, recordings of him playing live. So if that's yeah. something you're really interested in, I would definitely recommend that. Um, you know, his, his family, his wife, and one of his sons are running the record label now, and they're they're doing a great job of you know, keeping his memory alive, keeping his material out there. They've signed a lot of new artists to Oh Boy Records, and just yeah, they're they're, they're doing a good job of, of keeping keeping him present. All right, so next question. Oh, I like this one. Uh, so Angel from Montgomery is an amazingly powerful song. Um, even as a man, I still perform this song at every gig. Have you heard what the basis of this song is? I think I remember something about a rodeo poster was kind of, and he, 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 I believe he said it was kind of just inspired by women he knew in the neighborhood growing up in Chicago. Um, just, you know, working class neighborhood. I think he felt like a lot of these women were sort of old before their time had kind of hard lives. Um, and so it wasn't, I think, and I believe he said he said it in Montgomery, I said, yeah, Angel from Montgomery, because he was a Hank Williams fan, and Hank Williams is from Montgomery, Alabama. I think that's where the Montgomery card came from, but just kind of a hodgepodge. A lot of his songs were like that. They were just sort of pulling from different um, you know, stories, people, characters, just different, different little threads in his life that he put together to, to turn into a song. I mean, it seems like he really was kind of just an observer of everything that was going on around him. And then you, I can imagine him like furiously scribbling down thoughts about this and then kind of mixing and matching those things together yeah, to, make yeah. his, to make his songs. Yeah. Uh, lots of love for the card catalog in the comments. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll appreciate that. <laughs> So someone has asked, and this was actually one of my questions, uh, what's your next book? What are you working on now? I have finished the first draft of a biography of Doc Watson, a legendary North Carolina guitar player and singer from the mountains of North Carolina. Um, and I mentioned earlier, uh, Prine actually went to see Doc early on in Chicago, the, um, one of the folk festivals in Chicago. But yeah, I've been working on that for way too long. It's been about five years putting the first draft together, and it's in in the editorial process now. It will be published by the University of North Carolina Press. Um, probably going to be next spring before that comes out. I'm not sure. We, we don't have a set publication date for that yet. But um, had a lot of fun with that one. Wrote way too much, and it's going to have to be cut down, which is one reason it's taken a while. But um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's my next big project. I like that. I'm going to have to look for that. Um... <laughs> see yeah someone else agreeing with the amazing information that you can find in small hometown libraries when you're looking for personal research or just uh, other research I, I will say uh, for those of you who live in Fort Worth if you don't know we have a Fort Worth library actually has uh, uh, its own uh, history center uh, library now uh, which is archives and and uh, we're always kind of looking for uh, 
people who want to donate their papers that have, you know, had a significance in Fort Worth history. So, um, so the next question is, I think you mentioned that he had a bit of depression, but didn't really get into that. Can you kind of talk about that? I'm trying to remember. I don't remember. A, uh, that's that rank, vaguely rings a bell, but I definitely don't remember doing a lot on that. Um, he did have have some serious drinking issues, which is, often goes hand in hand with depression. Um, that was, I think, that was one of the reasons his manager would not cooperate with me. The, the one time his manager talked to me at length, he starts going into this long thing about people tell you these stories about John being drunk and doing this and that, and they're not true. And he just brings this up out of nowhere. So it's like, okay, th there's probably some truth to that if he feels the need to you know, make a di big deal out of it. And I've heard a lot of stories. He, he was definitely a drinker for a lot of his, his life and um, clean, cleaned up a good bit toward the uh, last 20 years or so of his life, I think, was you know, kind of settled down with his family and just uh, lived a different lifestyle. But you know, everybody was doing a lot of drugs and drinking a lot in the 70s and, in that world. Um, I, I would, so he, I would he say you know, even in, in today, um oh yeah, yeah i have lots of friends who are musicians <laughs> that, that there's lots of yeah. there's lots of drinking i mean it 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 kind of just sure, goes sure. with the with the territory of uh the job i i think um yeah, uh, yeah. so yeah i don't i don't know a lot more about the the, the I, I don't remember him ever talking a lot about his mental health in, in those kinds of terms but, you know uh, he probably did have some depression issues but i don't remember that being a a, a, a big thing. I, you know, so I don't remember coming across a lot of information about that. So someone else asked uh, also about Angel of Montgomery. He was only 25 when he wrote that song. Um, where does that insight come at that age? It's that's, kind of like that's, the that's term. That's a mystery. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because he he wrote. I don't think I don't I don't think he was 25. I think he was more like 22 when he wrote wow. that. If, if memory serves, he was young. Yeah, he wrote that song. He wrote Sam Stone. He wrote Hello in There. I mean, just these heartbreaking, gorgeous, insightful, empathetic. Just yeah, I, I don't know where that came from. He just it, there was something organic in him that that you know just really allowed him gave, gave him that deep insight into human nature and an ability to sort of condense you know pretty complex life stories down into a few verses of a song and, and make it something that people still, you know, the, the, the one person in, in the group here mentioned that they're still singing the song all these years later. You know, these, these songs have lasted like most people's songs do not last. They're, they, they're powerful songs that are still extraordinarily powerful half a century after he wrote them. Oh, and I have to say that that is actually one of my, my favorite songs. Um, I kind I kind of remember when it first came out with Bonnie Raitt and like yeah, yeah. it's it's just always one of those that kind of takes me back to that period of time of kind of what was going on uh when it when it came out so um I I I love that they're standing the test of time right yeah, yeah. um uh, did you run across any stories about him and his grandparents he talked a little bit about that um I remember he, he I mentioned earlier, Grandpa was a carpenter. He that that's pretty much a true story. His his grandfather, um, I think he, maybe his grandfather and father helped on. Um, it was a, a World's Fair in Chicago in the early '30s, or something like. You know, it may not have been called the World's Fair, but it was something in that vein, some kind of big expo kind of thing. And I think they were like carpenters working on that, and. Um, so yeah, they, and his grandparents actually lived with with the family in Chicago. I think his his mother's parents. I, I'd, I'd have to go back and double check that. But um, yeah, just uh, there's the line. The, I love the line about he voted for Eisenhower because Lincoln won the war. Um, just had you know just once again condensing just some really complex ideas down to just a, a few words. Um, and. Yeah, again, the, the, it was you know the extended family that feels like a real southern thing to me, having the multiple generations under one roof. Mm -hmm. um, and he said his dad always wanted. This is kind of getting away from the grandparents, but said his dad always wanted to go back to Muhlenberg County and thought they would, but just there there weren't the jobs down there. They, they kind of had to stay in Chicago to, to make a living. But um, I know he he was close to his extended family. He wrote the song Paradise about um, the town on the Green River in eastern Muhlenberg County, where some of his relatives lived. And he would go down and play with his cousins and see his aunts and uncles and just 
he, he was very connected to that extended family. And there's a great story in the book about him taking friends much later back to his hometown and there not being much, much left yeah. of it. Yeah. 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 Um, I went out there, Gwen and I went out to paradise and it's, it's, it's a power plant, <laughs> which he talks about in the song. There's absolutely nothing, you know, no sign of a town. There, there, if you wow. drive around these little back roads, there are some family cemeteries you can still see, but that's, that's all that's left of, of, you know, any sign of habitation in that part of, part of the county. Isn't that interesting? Um, uh, so I think this will this will be the last question we'll do. Um, how did Prime find the resolve to continue his career after his bouts of cancer that severely altered his voice? Um, well, one, one thing that helped with the first bout of cancer was that um, George Strait covered one of his songs and had a big hit with it and basically paid for his cancer treatment. So that was that was a huge wow. help. Um, and, yeah, he, he had never done anything else. I'm sure he just kind of felt like this is what I got to do. But he also was very serious about, you know, he, he, he put his health first. Um, there's a I remember a quote where the doctor said, you know, worried about doing this treatment to your to your neck because of how it might affect your singing. And he said, Doc, have you ever heard my voice? <laughs> like, there, there's only so far down my voice can go from where it is already. But it definitely it made his voice rougher. And you know, like I saw him, I've talked about this, I think, in the introduction of the book. I saw him sing around 2012, and he was really struggling to get any sound out for the first three or four songs. But he, he got over it, got over the hump and put on a terrific show. But it, it, it was a struggle. But I think it was just, you know, that was what he knew. That's what he did. He just didn't have, you know, I mean, it, it, yeah. it's hard to hard to start a new career when you're in your you know mid 50s or whatever he was at the time and have done one thing all your life. You know, prob probably wasn't going to go back to being a mail mail carrier. So, no. Um, uh, but yeah, I, he, he you know, got good treatment. He actually went to Houston, I think, for, for treatment, if I remember correctly. Is it MD Anderson Medical Center? Is that Houston? It is, um, yeah. 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 And then had a bout with, um, I think, with lung cancer later on. But um, just you know, got got some good treatment and and did did very well. Um, you know, especially to have been he was a heavy smoker for years, big drinker, just you know, not taking the best care of himself, overweight, all those sorts of things. So, um, you know, I'm I'm glad he was able to to survive and thrive as well as he did for as long as he did. I mean, I, I think too artist type fields it's kind of just who you are right like it's sort of hard to um it's your identity it's not just how you you make money right like it's it it's just who kind of who you are and what you yeah, do yeah. and absolutely yeah. and there's not a lot of okay well what a what am I going to do now? Right. Because yeah. this it's not know. going to work at the bank. <laughs> right. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. And even though I think there was kind of a, uh, some passages in the book where there were, some, there was some time where he had like in essentially writer's block where he really struggled oh, to yeah. kind of write yeah. new songs for a while, but then the inspiration would come. Right. And I, I, oh, I yeah. think that's, that's just the way it always is. More, more right? than once from divorces. So. <laughs> He talked to, I think, the Bruised Orange album and the uh, Missing Years albums were both pretty much divorce albums and inspired some amazing songs. So, yeah. Oh, and I, I talked in the, the first version of the book, first edition of the book, I you know, basically said the well is dry. He hasn't written new songs in a decade plus, and you know, he's probably not not ever going to give us any any great new songs. And then he did. So I was, I was quite happy to be proven wrong. And his, um, <laughs> his wife and kids basically shipped him off to a hotel and said you need to write some songs it's been too long and you know don't come back till you got a new batch of songs and it worked he, he wrote an amazing batch of songs for that last album i love that i love that also kind of knowing your partner to know hey we need to we need to send you somewhere where with where, where all the distractions are gone and you can exactly. just focus yeah. on what you need you focus on what you need to do and yeah. we'll be we'll be we'll be fine so yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm going to close it out with one last question because we've got about five minutes. So okay. when did you first become aware of his music? 
I don't really remember him grow, hearing him like as a kid. Um, I listened to there was a big rock station out of Raleigh, North Carolina, WQDR, that would play a lot of like you know Jimmy Buffett and James Taylor and some singer songwriter stuff. But if they played Prine, it didn't sink in. So it's probably early '80s. Um, I remember I used to get this newsletter called Rock and Roll Confidential that Dave Marsh, who's a fairly legendary rock critic. It was his newsletter. And I remember him writing about Prine a lot. And I think that's what inspired me to go buy one of his albums to begin with. And I remember hearing Unwed Fathers. That that may be the first song that really registered. I probably well, I heard Angel from Montgomery. I should say that. But I don't know if I knew Prine wrote it. it. It's like I knew the song, but not necessarily as a John Prine song for a while. Love the song, but it, it probably took a while to connect those dots. But um, yeah, the, Gail Davies had a big, big country hit with Unwed Fathers around 1984, and that's that may be the first time I really sort of you know made the connection of this is John Prine wrote this. He's an amazing songwriter, and started you know sort of building from there. My understanding of, of his work. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and I want to thank you also, uh, Eddie, for joining us. This has been a great conversation. Um, if Thank you would you. like to purchase a copy of the book, there are copies available at our local independent bookstore, The Dock. Um, you can purchase them online or at the store. Um, and uh, and so we, we hope that you do that. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for being here tonight and have a, have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks, everybody. This has been great. Good night.